So welcome back, everyone. Um, our if if we were all in a room together, we would have a rather full room. It, we've been hovering between seventy and eighty-five uh, participants, which is far more than we had expected. Uh, I see there are people in I think every continent, almost every continent, which is one thing we probably would not have been able to do as easily were we together in person. But let me just. Uh, introduce very briefly Professor Stephanie Wong from Valparaiso University, who will be speaking uh, again about Gresnik and also Celso Costantini, perhaps from a very theological perspective. Professor, Professor Wong. Hello. Thank you so much for having me here. I'm presenting here on uh, Costantini and Gresnik's theology, as best I can deduce it, of cultural genius and inspiration in their architectural indigenization. Now, I'm so pleased that Professor Cummins has been emphasizing the extent to which Gresnikt was perhaps a mouthpiece for uh, Celso Constantini, because that was my own reading of it. Being more familiar with Constantini's works from some of my other research, I kept thinking, gosh, this Gresnik guy thinks just like Constantini. So um, I would wholly support this uh, thesis that we seem to be teasing out that perhaps uh, Costantini is really the, the, the key figure behind it all. Um, let's see. Oops. Okay, so the main point that I hope to make here um, is about the way we understand their project of in indigenization in the architecture. And I want to stress that they were not conceiving it in any simplistic way of simply reclothing the gospel in Chinese garb, putting the gospel into Chinese style. I want to emphasize how they hoped, um, and I'm going to draw on their writings quite a bit to, to try to demonstrate it. They hoped for a much more organic picture of how architecture might play in the task of evangelization. And I'm going to emphasize their um, metaphors for the indigenization process, hoping that they might cultivate and encourage a kind of rich Chinese soil that might be itself revitalized by the germ of faith that they see Catholicism um, enriching China with. And so this offers us a more um, complex picture of indigenization or enculturation than perhaps we might at first think. And I, I'm going to propose that the missionary, uh, Costantini at least, sees his effort as one getting rid of sort of incongruous elements of the, the architectural landscape um, as uh, we noted earlier he's concerned about the proliferation of Gothic architecture, but also hoping he hopes to fertilize the landscape with uh, rich fertilizer for this um, germ of faith to grow. And he does so not just with the poles of you know, the gospel and culture or the missionary transmitter and the indigenous receiver, but also truly does have a, a spiritual or theological third pole, which is the increase that he believes God will build. Okay. So what I'm going to do here is talk a little bit about what Eugenio Manigon mentioned a second ago, that enculturation is a little bit anachronistic to use as a word here. Then I want to introduce these terms of genius and inspiration that I saw throughout the, the writings. Then talk about some of the specific metaphors that um, Gresnik and Constantini use for talking about the interplay between faith and culture. Then I'll try to um, offer kind of a critique and maybe a defense on, on their grounds of this cultural genius concept. So the first thing I do want to note is that although we might describe what they were doing it, as enculturation, if we define it um, widely enough, this was not the term used at the time. More commonly, uh, thinkers like Vincent Leb or um, Costantini were themselves using the term indigenization or simply talking about making the church Chinese. Um, and I also, like Professor Cummins, want to draw attention to Nicholas Standard's very useful wide definition of enculturation um, in acknowledging that we can use this word today, I think, to legitimately try to um, 
refer to the many multifaceted moves that Costantini and, and perhaps Grezdik were interested in in their missiological thinking. Standard defines enculturation as the incarnation of the evangelical life and message in a particular cultural context and through the members of that culture in such a way that the Christian experience is expressed not only in terms of that culture, that would be simple adaptation, but so that it becomes a source of inspiration, direction and unification, transforming and remaking it so as to bring about a new creation, which enriches not only the specific culture, but the universal church. Now, this is a definition of enculturation that I think does largely apply to what Costantini and Gresnik are doing. Um, but the term itself is relatively recent and was not in use um, by Costantini himself, as far as I found. Um, some of the first references we have to the word enculturation are from the 1955 Missiology Week. Um, then the sense of enculturation as a relationship between gospel and culture enters into the picture, especially with Vatican II. Um, and I want to note a couple of the ways in which that happens, because I think uh, Costantini and the situation in China in many ways um, anticipates what will be made more explicit in Vatican II later on. So in Gaudium it says, um, the, the way that the text is structured emphasizes the gospel uh, in interaction with first actually a kind of generic human culture before the text structurally talks about specific elements of diverse cultures. It discusses things like family, for instance, that the uh, council theologians seem to be imagining as kind of universal elements of the human experience before we reach more specific elements that would be distinctive to Chinese culture or German culture and so on. Um, and I think that's important because uh, Gresnik and Costantini's writing sometimes appeal to a more generic sense of uh, faith interacting with culture um, as something that all humans participate in. Secondly, Lumen Gentium, in a discussion on the relationship and unity of the visible and mystical um, bodies, the hierarchy and the mystical body of Christ, emphasizes um, how this relationship takes on the character of incarnation. Quote, as the assumed nature inseparably united to him serves the divine word as a living organ of salvation, so, in a similar way, do the visible social structures of the church serve the spirit of Christ who vivifies it in the building up of the body. I just want to draw your attention to the analogy that's being drawn here in this later 20th century period between the relationship between the word and um, salvation and the um, visible institutional social elements of the church in reality. And that's because in the later 20th century, enculturation often takes on the specific theological connotations of incarnation. And in 1977, the Synod of Bishops on Catechetics uses the term enculturation for the first time in a formal magisterial way um, with approval for that theological sense of incarnation. Now, I want to note some of the pros and cons of this. Um, because I, I'm not convinced that Costantini and Gresnik are um, going to be, uh, I guess, either fulfilling or guilty of some of the, the critiques of the enculturation model. Some of the pros of seeing enculturation as an incarnation are that it provides a strong theological warrant for one, the enfleshment of faith into the particularity of historical cultures. And two, a benefit is that this incarnational analogy um, can explain and justify the serial translation of the gospel into other vernaculars. This is, these are arguments that have made, been made um, very frequently by world Christianity scholars such as Andrew Walls and La Mansana. But some of the critiques of enculturation, especially as the late 20th century Catholic Church emphasized incarnation are these. 
um, first of all, it could uh, raise uh, an overly static picture of gospel as something that's simply packaged into culture. Robert Schreider has criticized what he calls the kernel and husk theory of enculturation, um, where we have too, uh, too much of a polarity between the outside carrier and the, the inner content presumed to be somehow uh, inviolable and repackaged in different cultures. So that's one of the uh, critiques of enculturation. Um, here's where he makes that critique that this language might imagine a kind of privileged supracultural sphere, which allows for then immediate translation into any given culture. He thinks this is, uh, doesn't give us an integrated and dynamic enough picture. The second con of seeing enculturation as a kind of incarnation is there's a sort of tension in the theology where the word has priority, right? It is the word um, made flesh where the, the divinity is what affects this um, union with what the theory, theorists of the encounter want to emphasize today, which is to attribute primary agency not to foreign missionaries entering in, but rather to the local context and people. Okay. So one example, though there are many, would be our colleague here, Professor Kuhlmans, who notes, um, and I think he represents many, many theorists, the desire for indigenization or enculturation to be that process whereby those belonging to the particular culture, they express from within that culture what they have received from another culture. Um, so those are some of the two tensions potentially of the incarnation model. And I wanted to flag that because I think what Kostantini and Gresnik are doing is something else. On the one hand, they are not you know, great paragons of grassroots indigenous agency. These um, two men are foreigners. At the same time, I don't think they fall prey to the critique of a simple kernel and husk repackaging. That's not what they understood themselves to be doing. And so in the rest of this presentation, I wanna go into some of their writings to show the um, kind of dynamism and the organic language that they use to uh, represent the, the relationship between faith and culture. When I was reading uh, the articles by Gresnik, I was struck time and time again by how often the words genius and inspiration came up in the texts. And this is also true of Costantini's writings elsewhere. So I've pulled out some of the quotes where this idea of the genius of the Chinese people um, arises. And at first blush, one thing that it seems to accomplish for Costantini is it's a way of expressing that there's an authenticity there in Chinese society that he wants to be respected. He says, for instance, Catholicism respects the particular genius of each people and their own proper culture when this is not opposed to Catholic verity. Or in talking about art, he says, we desire originality, sincerity of the church and genuine expression of the genius of the indigenous people. The religious and artistic culture of the great Christian tradition will not impede in any way the authentic and original expression of the local artists. So in talking about a Chinese genius, it's clear he wants there to be something there that is authentic, that is creative, that is unique. And this is what he hopes to elevate in uh, the architectural work as well as the other endeavors of Furen University like the um, painting school that was there. Gresnik also uses this language of genius. Um, and so I've got two passages here that highlight his shared uh, appeal to Chinese authenticity. He says, in common with all other cultured peoples, the Chinese have expressed in their arts the ideals and qualities of their race. So here he specifically links it in kind of an ethnic sense of Chinese identity. 
their architecture no less than their literature reflects the peculiar genius and aspirations of China's spirit. It is the silent language of the Chinese soul. In other passages, both by Gresnik and also Costantini, they um, will use the language of um, hoping for the architecture to reflect the true spirit of China. Um, so again, there's a conviction that in Chinese society, there is a um, quality that is distinct to China that should be preserved. And that so long as it does not play out in ways that would be in contrast to the Catholic faith, Costantini warns, it should be honored, respected, highlighted, and appreciated. So this is puzzling to me, all this language of, um, of a, a genius, a spirit, what exactly does he mean when it comes to questions of missiology? So I looked through some of the metaphors that show up. In an essay called um, The Problem of Culture, Chosso Costantini uh, uses a technological metaphor. So this is the first one I'd like to offer for your consideration. And one thing to notice here is that he's actually not talking about it as a relationship between the gospel and the context. And I think that's important for us to keep in mind that so often um, in, especially in secondary scholarship, it's easy to talk about the gospel as a kind of translation of the Bible or the text or the message. But these early 20th century thinkers more often use the word faith. And I think that's actually significant that they're talking about an experience, a happening, and not necessarily imagining that there is a message to be translated, which again, is I think is closer to that kind of packaging, repackaging model of enculturation. He uses here a technological metaphor from electricity. He says, the electric wire is not the light and does not produce the light, but it is the indispensable means by which is transmitted the current for the light. Thus culture is not the light, but serves as a vehicle to the light. And he quotes Romans 10, faith then comes by hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. Now, I think this metaphor of electricity and the wire could seem as though the culture is just a carrier for faith. Um, is this just a vehicle? But I think it's actually, he's emphasizing here the necessary character of the wire. If you don't have a wire, you don't have any electricity, you don't have any visible light. Um, I also think this sort of metaphor, this sort of analogy is highly integrative. integrative. Um, I'm not certain how much Chinese philosophy Costantini would have been aware of, um, but the light was very often in Chinese philosophy and Buddhism and Neo-Confucianism, one of the key examples of the kind of unity of Qi and Yong, right? That the, the substance or the um, body of a thing is inseparable from its use. Like you can't have the use without the thing. So lamps and the light they produce were often a metaphor. And I think it's also an integrative um, dynamic sort of analogy for him to use because even in science, and again, I don't know what his understanding of the electromagnetism would have been, there's actually not a categorical difference between say the electromagnetism in a line of electricity, the uh, electricity traveling, which is simply changing form when it becomes visible light, electromag electromagnetic changing form. Now, I doubt he was aware of all that, but I think this usage of the electricity um, shows that he was already thinking in kind of more dynamic ways than simply repackaging the gospel. Um, and what's at stake for them? In, in a lot of the passages, Gresnik and Costantini worry about the loss of life in Chinese society as well as in various Western societies. And so they talk about um, the importance of recapturing a principle of life. And I think that's important to keep in mind that they hope the indigenization work they're doing will help to vitalize society again so that it's not a dead wire, so to speak. <clears throat> 
The second set of metaphors I'd like to talk about are agricultural ones. Um, and here, Constantini and Gresnik's emphasis is on how the flourishing and the growth they hope for is not the sort of thing that you can guarantee by you know, getting the right missionary strategy. Rather, they're hoping to indigenize with um, the optimism that then God will operate. Okay? So he says, for instance, culture will teach us to study the ground and the manner of sowing the word of God, but the rest, the life and the flourishing of that germ are a gift of grace. Um, our previous speaker mentioned Maritain on the fecundity of universal Catholicity. And so I think this um, organic language of growth and the fecundity of things growing is not unique to Constantini. It was uh, prevalent in many missiologists at the time. And so Costantini refers to biblical passages that put the stress on God's agency. We are only poor sowers who wait for everything from the master of the harvest, who is infinitely good and powerful and who will make smile the glorious spring after the cold and dismal winter. Here he's referring to parables in Mark 4 about sowing seed and 1 Corinthians 3 on how it is God who gives the, the increase even after others have planted and watered. And I think you see this also in Gresnik's writings. Uh, there was a, a moment in one of the articles where um, he stresses that if you can only build one thing, either a, church, either a school or a church, build the school. And he, he concludes, because God will take care of the chapel. Okay. So I think, although this is very spiritual and um, theological, this conviction of theirs that God is a player in this as well, I think we shouldn't lose sight of that, that we shouldn't over-determine the extent to which they thought their indigenization strategies and techniques were actually going to, you know, guarantee a certain kind of yield. Uh, throughout their writings, they're using metaphors that hint at almost three parties involved of the, um, you know, the one offering the, the germ, the seed of, um, of faith, those, the culture, the soil in which it is heard, but the, the growing, the actual increase, the actual life, um, they attribute to this third party, God. In this agricultural metaphor, I see a strong emphasis on um, hoping to re-enrich the soil itself. And here we're talking about China, okay? Um, and so he, there is a sense in which Constantini and Gresnik hoped that their enculturation efforts would help pave the way for the gospel in China, if we think about it as a kind of insertion of something into the context, there is that there. He asks in my first quote here, what precious aids does culture offer? to the task of propagating the name of Christ. So indeed, Costantini is thinking missiologically about a kind of transmission. But at the same time, he it's not simply as though the context is just kind of a, a I know, channel through which the faith is to be communicated. He has an ultimate interest in making that soil enriching. He says in the second quote, the crisis of China and the missions is not a question of a crisis in the form of government, but the crisis of an ageless culture slowly decomposing and like the seed slowly maturing, slowly suffering its bitter travail that precedes rebirth. Okay. So in a passage like this, we see Costantini um, making an assessment of Chinese culture. He calls it an ageless culture that's slowly decomposing. And yet he doesn't ultimately want to see China decline into nothingness. He's hoping for a kind of rebirth and imagines that that's where uh, mission will serve a useful, uh, provide a useful aid to China in a process of rebirth. So again, there's a hope for enlivening 
enlivenment. We must know how to enter into the spirit of Chinese architecture to enliven it with the Christian life. So this all is my way of trying to highlight that in their writings, we have a much more nuanced, often much more dynamic picture of what's going on in the expression and reinterpretation of faith than simply any kind of enculturation as, you know, insertion into a new package. Okay. I think what Costantini and Kresnik are, are functionally doing is something that scholar, secondary scholars today have called for. Um, Gianni Crivier and Yang, um, Yang Hui Lin have emphasized that they've proposed the term interculturality. Um, and by that, they're trying to emphasize that there's a more fundamental human interpretive activity that goes on even below um, any particular instance of a verbal or uh, artistic translation. Um, Young here says, defining the motivational force behind enculturation as transculturality means regarding the transmission of the Christian faith as a sort of universal activity of comprehension, not merely a cultural grafting from west to east. The essential point of enculturation rests first in the interconnection between faith and the value of existence and not in their interconnection between faith and the cultural carrier. Okay. So what I hear them calling for is um, there's a, a warning there not to read the missionary experience of Westerners going to Asia as paradigmatic of the fundamental relationship between faith and culture, as though we always grant faith to the foreign missionary and culture to the indigenous locals. Rather, in any context, there's going to be a relationship between um, faith and uh, existence, and culture is the, the soil in which that is done. I think that Konstantin and Gresnik's metaphors hint at this kind of an understanding of what goes on in the indigenization process. Going back to the concept of genius, um, I want to offer both a critique and then a defense as best I can um, on Konstantin and Gresnik's writings of this term. I think to many of us today, it, it's, it smacks of a kind of essentialization of culture. On what grounds can you talk about a Chinese genius? What really are we talking about? Um, and there are moments where it does seem to me, and I'm happy for others to disagree with me in the comments, that Costantini really is gesturing at sort of stereotypes of Chinese identity. Um, he says in one of his writings, the religion of the Chinese people consists essentially in filial piety. So at the end of the day, there are moments where it seems like Chinese genius boils down to filial piety. He's not the first to make that association. Um, but I find it a little disappointing that all of this lofty language of Chinese genius and inspiration um, seems very hard to pin down, except in moments like this on filial piety. So to Gresnik writes that real genius and fine taste displayed, oh, real ge genius is in fine taste displayed by the Chinese in thus enhancing the beauties of nature. So this is, comes in an article where he's been emphasizing just how consonant Chinese architecture is with nature. And it, for him, it seems that's then what's paradigmatic about the Chinese genius is the closeness with nature. Okay. Um, I'm not disagreeing that these might certainly be aspects of Chinese architectural norms and um, ideals, but it feels a little underdetermined to me that so much of their hopes for the indigenous indigenization project were pitched towards this sense of a Chinese genius to be cultivated. Um, and yet they're very circumspect most of the time on what that might be. Meanwhile, there's another poll. They hope that the genius, the Chinese genius, will be cultivated under a Catholic soul, spirit, sensibility, inspiration. Um, 
especially through Costantini's writings, he emphasizes how this Chinese genius is going to come to even greater fruition under the gentle influence of Catholic sensibilities, for instance. Um, and we see this in Costantini's work with the paintings at Furin, at the painting school founded there at the, um, in, in Beijing. He hopes that painters, Chinese painters, can bring their Chinese genius to the project of the art, but that their work will be cultivated under a Catholic spirit. And what does this mean in practice? Well, when he's inviting a, at that point, non-Catholic painter to head up this new, what will become the art department, um, Chen Yuandu, he shows him a number of examples of Madonnas and childs. And he basically tells him, okay, copy one of these, do it in a Chinese style, but do it under the genre of Madonna and child. And you see there how Costantini very much wants it to be authentically Chinese. And that's why he hires this Chinese artist to paint it. But he also does have a sense of what's, what the Catholic sensibility is. And that's the love, the tenderness, the human relationality that he thinks is best captured by the genre of Madonna and child. Okay. Um, in Gresnik's case, he, I think a parallel example I saw was in one of his discussions of altars, where, well, what exactly is the Catholic sensibility, the Catholic inspiration that is going to help revitalize Chinese genius? Um, he's, Oh, he, actually, this is Costantini talking about Gresnik's good work. And he says, in his buildings, he made use of elements of traditional Chinese art, but infused them with a new Christian soul. So again, Costantini's emphasizing the, the Catholic spirit or soul as the uh, fertilizing element. And Gresnik, in his writings, talks about altars, where he wants to acknowledge that the altar might be located in different parts of the church. And he makes a historical case for why that's legitimate even in different Western churches of different shapes and sizes that the altar might be moved. Nonetheless, there will be an altar and it's the presence of the altar, the fact that this is a church which bestows a Catholic sensibility, the Catholic spirit upon the project. Okay. There are moments where it seems like this might be itself a kind of mission civilisatrice in the aesthetic realm. I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that either Costantini or Gresnik give off an imperialistic ethos in any way. They were so dedicated to the project of indigenizing the church and uh, removing inappropriate French influences. Nonetheless, there are moments where this relationship between Catholic spirit and Chinese genius does very strongly emphasize the, the transforming power of Christian art upon the culture. This, is, this passage here shows that clearly. Costantini writes, Christian art marches onward from century to century, renewing itself, transforming itself in the Renaissance, the Baroque, the neoclassic. It lives expressing the great life of the Catholic church, a stranger in no place or country, dominating by her powerful genius, subjecting to her service every form of art. Let us not arrest in China this triumphal march of Christian art. Let us enrich her universal language, offering her the possibility of assimilating new elements and creating new forms of beauty. So even as Constantini would have opposed to the death, I think, any um, purposing of Chinese for French aims, he does say that Chinese art ultimately is going to be subjected um, for the service of Catholic the Catholic Church, and that no genre of Chinese art should not be rallied in this triumphal march of Christian art in the world. Okay. So again, that there are moments where they seem to appeal to a essentialist sense of Chinese culture in this discussion of inspiration and genius. At the same time, in um, trying to understand why they might do that. I noticed a couple moments where our writers talk about the revitalization of culture by means of other contextual facts. So I'm not convinced that either thinks that cultural genius, even if it is so important, is the end all be all or the only determinant of the indigenization project. 
In fact, there are passages where Costantini seems to pitch cultural genius as just a part of a larger contextual set of formative, what he calls characteristics. Quote, all people have their own well-defined characteristics, which find their most solemn expressions in architecture. These various artistic characteristics are the results of many elements, culture, but also customs, taste, historical and religious facts, materials of construction, local temperature and climate, and all the rest. And so I think in a moment like this, we see how architecture is doing a whole lot more than just serving as a random site of indigenization of, oh, well, there's a, there's a you know, cultural batch of soil to grow our Christian seed. Rather, architecture is an, an arena where local realities of building materials, the climate, you know, whether you, whether you need to build the roof at a certain pitch for snow or not, where these very practical considerations do bear upon the project. And I think this is one of the arenas where um, Costantini rightly sees that architecture is in some sense always already contextual. It can't not be responsive to the demands of the local context because you're trying to build in a certain place with the resources that are available. So I think this may uh, mitigate against some of the possible critiques we might have of their project as an essentialist one, and that they don't necessarily see cultural genius as the overarching bucket of all of Chinese identity. Rather, cultural genius is sitting here along other sometimes very practical concerns of construction. Um, so in conclusion, uh, Gresnik writes that what he hopes for is the retention in our mission architecture of those distinctly Chinese forms and lines which reflect the true spirit of China and satisfy most fully her aesthetic taste. Um, in this presentation, I have tried to present the, uh, the very theological underpinnings for that indigenization goal, where it is not only a matter of communicating a packaged message, but where they hoped to indeed cultivate a kind of revitalization of Chinese society where Catholic faith might um, play a enlivening role. And that's my conclusion. For Costantini and Gresnik, this project, this missiology is not simply about putting the gospel into Chinese style, but they hoped it would uh, support uh, the Chinese soil itself to be organically revitalized by the germ of faith. And their efforts were participating in a three-pronged relationship between the germ of faith, the soil of Chinese genius, and ultimately the growth that they thought could come only from God's activities. I welcome your questions. Thank you, Professor Wong. Thank you so much. Let's let's um, invite Professor Ethan Law from Princeton Theological Seminary, OMS, OMSC, I believe, to provide some uh, remarks about Professor Wong's presentation. Professor Law. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Clark, and thank you so much, uh, Professor Wong, for a super insightful presentation on on really on multiple levels. Uh, I could dive into this from so many angles, but I think when, while listening to you speak and, and reviewing some of the things that you uh, provided me earlier to reflect upon, um, I'd like to spend this time of response uh, focused on the topic of uh, interculturality, if you will, uh, one of the themes that you explored so well in uh, Grisnik and Constantini's uh, work. And really, I, I listening to your work and actually uh, just very much blessed by uh, earlier presentations that provided that thick context uh, that the articles themselves didn't give me when I was reading. Um, I more than ever, I'm I'm pondering this question of how uh, Grisnik and Constantini's Sino-Christian architecture is not shouldn't be read as 
just enculturation, but how can we read their work, their writings, and literally their architecture as interculturation, if you will. Um, in that sense, I, I, I found that even though they were writing with a very conscious mindset or they were designing these buildings with a very conscious mindset, sort of a one way focus of, you know, how do we indigenize the Christian spirit in the Chinese soil, you know, these kinds of one way um, enculturation perspectives and how much of that is actually also a process of interculturation. And what I mean by that is that, is there an unconscious process of drawing from the Chinese genius as much as they talk a lot about how important the Catholic spirit is? Because inevitably, as you dive into another culture, you have to investigate it, you have to understand it. And reading Grisnik's essays in particular, you praise it. And you even in some ways apologize for it to the readers of the essay. I was thinking about uh, who, you know, who was reading Grisnik's essays on Chinese architecture, right? And so I'm thinking you, you talked a lot about the, the kernel and the husk and that being sort of a, you know, a very standard way of thinking about enculturation. And so as I was reflecting on your passage and thinking about what, uh, what Grisnik and Constantini's role were in this bigger project, um, I thought about Constantini's agenda sort of as that top down propaganda piece, you know, but then I thought about Grisnik's process, right? Uh, that he sort of was working from the bottom up. I love those images that uh, Kuman shared earlier of the, of the sketches, right? Uh, he, was, he was out there trying to understand the Chinese aesthetic in order to design these buildings. Um, and it made me think about Constantini working with the Colonel, thinking really hard about the Colonel, right? And I thought about Grisnik maybe thinking, maybe perhaps with an aesthetic sensibility, thinking about the husk. And like the husk is important, right? Um, just like the conduit to electricity is important. Um, there are different types of materials. They, con they, can do, they conduct electricity differently, some better than others. Um, you know, certain husks are better than others. They protect the seed better than other seeds and then other husks perhaps. And so as much as I um, thought that there was uh, clearly something of um, this desire to create, to, to plant the, the Catholic spirit in Chinese soil, the big question on my mind that I would love to hear some of your reflections on, uh, Professor Wong, is to what extent were Grisnik and Constantini also drawing inspiration changing their Catholic spirit in their engagement with the Chinese genius, if you will, if you want to use those terms, that as they dwelled more and more upon the Chinese genius, if you will, or the Chinese spirit, did, did their Catholic spirit change? Did engaging a new conduit or a new husk make them see the kernel differently? Because that, I think, is the dy dynamic of interculturality that you were speaking of, right? Um, that as much as things go one way, if you're really trying to go one way, you inevitably create uh, an opposite flow as well. And um, I am not a scholar of, of these, two, um, these two figures, but it, thinking about everything you presented made me think a lot about James Legg in terms of the in, in Protestant uh, uh, missionary work. And although he was translating text, I thought about translating text as well as translating architecture. And the more you engage that, perhaps the more you find yourself on both sides. And so the question is, based on your readings of particularly Constantin, uh, Constantini's work, um, that perhaps you can see across a greater amount of time, do you see him um, critiquing Western culture or reconsidering things about uh, you know, the, the, the context that he comes from uh, as he spends and engages you know, the Chinese context more. Um, and I know that one has to be very careful about that because he is writing for a particular audience, right? He, he isn't necessarily going to write about all of his, his doubts and questions for a public setting. I did find, on the same note though, I did find uh, Grisnik's uh, writings really, really uh, fascinating 
one because yes he does essentialize quite a bit uh, I, I had the same feelings you did uh dr wong about sort of his essentialization of the chinese-ness but at the same time uh the the amount of um how do you say respect he gives to oh look at the way that they do uh you know they're more in touch with nature their architecture you know, he's in, is engaging perhaps with a whole new aesthetic that he was never trained in as an artist. You know, I th and I wonder if that was thrilling for him. I wonder if that was, I mean, yes, he's traveled a lot, but you know, America and Europe is one thing. Brazil may be another, but China wholly other in some way. And I do wonder for Grisnik as an artist, more so than a missionary, um, if his engagement with a completely different aesthetic and architectural style uh, reshape some of his thinking. Um, and this, I would need an art historian perhaps to answer this question, but does his art look different after his five years in China at all? Um, maybe it uh, doesn't. I mean, he doesn't write a lot, right? So he doesn't write about it, but I do wonder how much it may have changed him, which again, touches on this question and these, these notes of interculturality. How do, um, as much as, and I guess I'll conclude by emphasizing this, as much as uh, Constantine and, and Gresnik's Sino-Christian architecture were seeking to, uh, in, to plant sort of the, the germ of the Catholic spirit in Chinese soil and, and draw from the Chinese genius to, to revive it in some ways, how much in the process did they draw from the Chinese, their perception of the Chinese genius, how, regardless of how essentialized it may have been? Um, that's the big question sitting on, on, on my mind as hard, and heart as I listen to you, because I think it has important missiological um, implications um, that under, the, under the, the explicit text of enculturation, that there's always some level of interculturation happening. And in that sense, perhaps there are theologies of religion that are operating that may not even be conscious, uh, you know, things about how do other cultures bring something that uh, you don't expect and in fact you need. I think about perhaps if uh, was, were, was Gris, uh, Grisnik's writings, did they touch on something that he saw lacking in European culture at the time? You know, and that's what, that's what creates the essentializing to some extent um, that he sees a certain lack. And so these are, um, a few of the thoughts I had uh, thinking about um, what you shared and uh, looking forward to uh, some of your, your, your responses and questions from uh, the audience as well. So thank you again, everyone for this opportunity. Thank, thank, you, you, thank you so much. Um, Professor Wong, uh, I'll let you respond. I'll have you respond to Professor Law first and then we'll open it up. And then about 10 after or 15 after we'll Around then, we'll open it up for a more general discussion based upon all the presentations. So anyway, Professor Wong. Thank you for that response. Um, I really appreciate that. And I, I also had not given my presentation to him much before, so he's kind to, um, to respond so generously. Um, I guess what I'd like to do is make a distinction between, I think, what the theology evokes versus what they were functionally doing. Because I, my own take is that they're somewhat at odds. In my presentation of the Colonel Husk metaphor, I was actually introducing that as a point of contrast that I think in the, the later post-Vatican II sense of incarnation, there's a, a stronger sense of a packaging that I think is anachronistic and we shouldn't assume that Kostantini and Gresnik um, we're thinking about it that way. And that's what I was hoping to show with the quotations is that their own writing is actually not one way. I don't think they hoped, I don't think they were envisioning a kind of one way process of inserting the gospel into Chinese culture. All of their work in indigenization was, was primarily stressing the other direction of how is it that we can revitalize Chinese society um, in order to bear good faithful fruit. That's at least how I read the emphasis. It's of course two ways, but I, I was really struck in reading their images, uh, their metaphors for the relationship between faith and culture that um, it's not 
it's not necessarily assuming a kind of Western missionary entry into the Chinese context as the primary direction. I think they were sincere in their efforts to rethink mission from a truly indigenous um, direction. Now, were they actually doing that is I think the big question for me. And I would tend to agree with what I understand Professor Kuman's point to be that functionally this was a kind of modern chinoisery, you know, that they were not ultimately able to find easily, you know, a Chinese architect to do this. And, and Costantini has the same problem in the art school at Furen. He spends multiple years searching for Chinese painters who can launch a, an indigenous Chinese art school. And he is not initially able to find a Chinese Catholic artist to just do the Catholic Chinese genius, holy Catholic, holy Chinese, wonderfully united together. And so he compromises. He finds this non-Christian artist and gives him some Raphael to look at and says, hey, okay, keep your Chineseness. I really like your style. This is very subtle. This is really good Chinese art. Do that, but look at Raphael and imitate it. Can you reproduce that? And I think that's where you see the limitations of this very lofty romantic vision of indigenization, that when, when the rubber really hits the road, what he ends up having to do is show Chinese people Western stuff. Um, so I, I think that's what I would do is I would, I see a kind of, I don't know, there's some daylight between the ideals of indigenization as this very organic process that's going to grow out of the authentic Chineseness that so the society has a long heritage of that we hope to revitalize and, and help to cultivate. And nonetheless, the effort to make it Catholic still in practice involves bringing over, you know, a Benedictine architect from Europe. It, it means showing Raphael to the Chinese painter so that he has a sense of what you're going for. So I think that really calls into question just how, um, how obvious are these things then? You know, if in fact you have to show an Italian example of a Madonna and child to communicate the Catholic sensibility that's supposed to be so universal, so accessible to all, isn't that a problem? That would be my critique of the function, the practical problems they kept running into in, in these different arenas of architecture and art. Thank you, thank you. As ever, uh, there is a, a rich discussion happening in the chat. Let me let me throw out a question that is that has come here, and then perhaps look at some questions in in the chat. So here's one: uh, Professor Kumans and Menegon noted a kind of top-down sinicization. And your talk focuses on uh, Kostantini and Gresnik's mentions of Chinese genius and inspiration. It seems that um, Chinese nationalism, sort of taking this, referring your talk to uh, previous talks, it seems that Chinese nationalism was created perhaps using architecture by non-Chinese Europeans. So as a theologian thinking about this question, uh, this, this person is asking, uh, thinking about Kuman's quotation of Maritan, um, can we simply reframe, this is the question, can we simply reframe the entire Sino-Christian hybrid project as a form of Western Christian triumphalism? I mean, I think it's possible to do that. And I that's where that quote of the kind of aesthetic triumph of Catholic art um, shows that even in his desire to promote indigenous art, Costantini is still thinking of Christian art as something other than Chinese art, right? And so, as you noted in your own presentation, that he creates these polarities of Sino and Christian and essentially reinforces the polarity that he's trying to overcome, I think in his writings, we see that pattern time and time again, that he sees the Christian as something other than the Chinese and 
wants it to play a harmonious, integrative, organic kind of role in the midst of the Chinese, but it is nonetheless other. And what other is it then? Um, in practice, it seems very often to be the European. Right, and I, I just want to note that um, Professor Kumans notes that Gresnik was a Benedictine, so that that part of that context of his own life contextualizes his own theology. Here's a question by uh, Father Carboneau. I'll just read it. Uh, at the at the time that Furen is being formulated and being constructed, my reading of Costantini is that he is also trying to figure how this faith will with will live in the political civil society of the Guomindang. Costantini was also redefining the missionaries um, that, that they have to survive and preach as were Chinese priests and sisters and also the Chinese Catholics themselves. China was province by province in a real chaos and Catholics were caught in the matrix as well. Any sense of Costantini and his political faith and face? Mm. As Professor Cummins noted, he Costantini was very much targeting the elites. You know, this whole project at Furen University was an elite project, um, and so I think it's fair to say that his indigenization efforts hope to carve out some security for the church, and you see that actually really clearly in. In the founding of the art department at Furen University, that actually provides a way for the Catholic institution to serve the state's goals. Because one thing that the um, Guomindang government wants is art teachers who can teach Chinese art. So that it, the government has its own interest in cultivating the arts as a matter of Chinese unification and modernization. And, um, and so the founding of Furen's art department is a very strategic one that it essentially enables them to say, hey, look, we're training up young future art teachers for the government schools. So it's both serving a Catholic indigenization goal and also demonstrating how the Catholics are raising up young people who can serve the state's goals. So I think he's very strategic in that way. Um, yeah, so I, I would agree that he's, he's aware of the Guomindan's state projects and is hoping to find common ground between the missionary indigenization and, and the good fruit he hopes that will build and the strategic um, demonstration he hopes to offer of how Catholics will, will be useful for the new nation. Excellent, thank you. So let me just open up if anyone else has a question. Uh, I, I, I have a few more here. But let me open it up. If anyone else has a question specifically for Professor uh, Stephanie Wong, I'd love just you could unmute or raise your hand. As we can hear my clock chiming in the background. Any other questions? All right, well, let me just, um, what I'd like to do then, um, and well, let me just stop. Professor Wong, do you have any final remarks uh, that you would like to, to uh, um, provide before we open up to general thoughts and questions? I guess I'd just like to hear a little more from Professor Cummins about does, do we know that um, for instance, Costantini was actually the ghostwriter for these essays, or is that just a hypothesis? I'm curious more about that, because right. I, I saw so much similarity in their thought and in their style of writing. Yeah, I think Professor Menegon had the same thesis. Uh, I, I, I have no written proof of it, but as you have seen, um, my whole research was built on a very... Um, accurate chronology, because these years, 1920s and 30s in China are fascinatingly dense. And to understand the context of time and space, which are very complex, uh, it is important to have a very precise possible uh, timelines. And uh, 
by looking to Gresnik's five years in China, by the high amount of his work, because he lived mainly in Beijing, but he traveled to the four sites of the, the, the educational buildings he designed. So he always visited the site once huh, to have the inspiration of the site and to understand the orientation, the feng shui and these kinds of things. So he, he understood that what was that, that was important. But for the rest, he was so 100% busy with what he had to do. And uh, he was not very social person. He is a monk. Huh? Again, he was living in a community that was closed. He was not, uh, you know, uh, walking in Beijing alone and discovering things on, on his own. This is absolutely not the case. So I don't see where this guy could have start to read, to read what? To understand Confucius, he never heard about it, and he perhaps never knew about it when he was leaving China, or or very little. So we have not to overthink about what he was able to write. All the more, he never wrote anything else. He's not a writer. So this is these are mostly my arguments. It's a lack of time. It's a lack of background, and uh, he he was really. Uh, meeting Costantini very often. They were traveling together also, you know, when Costantini was doing field trips and, and, and you know, ordaining bishops and these kind of things. Well, often Gresnik was traveling with him. But that's it. <laughs> so I think there was, there was a, a communion in, in what they were, well, in their understanding, but Costantini was telling Gresnik what he has to do and how he had to understand China. On the other hand, I think Costantini is an absolute um, agent of the Holy See. He's an Italian Monsignore, he's an Eminence Gris, he's a very high politician. Don't think he's there only for the love of the Chinese. He's there to fight against Protestants. He's there to try to infiltrate some elite milieu. And uh, it's, it's a question, he's also tried to uh, put the French missionary aside and raise other groups, uh, especially Italians. So it is a very, very complex guy who has a terrible agenda and he's also constantly traveling with Europe and with the United States, including for a cancer surgery during that time. So it is fascinating to see what these guys did, again, with my, as a historian, uh, chron very strong chronology. May I say That's just one thing? Please, please, Professor Menegon. So terrible agenda, maybe it's a little harsh. Uh, you have to imagine that uh, actually this is part of uh, a missionary um, change, change in the Catholic Church that is happening under Varrosum and that in to a large extent, uh, comes from China, although also from uh, the theology and the thinking of others already from the late 19th century. Uh, so, you know, uh, obviously, Costantini is uh, a nuncius, that means an ambassador, and uh, he has two identities. One is the representative of a state, the, the, Vatican, the, city, the Vatican City, or the Holy See, actually, better see. Uh, yeah, at the time, it's still the Holy See. And then uh, he is also, though, uh, someone who's trying to represent propaganda fide. And propaganda indeed uh, had uh, its own ideas, and Van Rossum has its own ideas. Um, so um, you also have to consider that some of these people, like Zanin later on, I think they had been in Japan, uh, they have to keep into account uh, all kinds of political issues, uh, the rise of Japanese militarism, uh, the problem of the controversy with Shinto that happens there, Manchu Guo a few years later. So it is impossible for these representatives from Rome not also to take into account the politics. Uh, I would say that certainly it is a top-down uh, movement and that uh, this idea of universalism that Stephanie Wong touched upon, that you, Professor Coleman, touched upon, and that uh, it's behind to an extent the use of Gothic that you mentioned before, Professor Clark, uh, is to me the sticking point, is the fact that uh, in there are no Chinese voices that we hear 
uh, right now in this kind of uh, presentation you have given us, but actually there are some of those voices. I mentioned Ilyandre. Ilyandre in 1917 writes this uh, exhortation to study, which is uh, really, I would say, the constitution of uh, Catholic education in China by a Chinese and is very critical of the missionary methods. Of course, he's in conversation with Lebe, with Kota at the time, but he has done this for years. And it is through these conversations that uh, things are emerging as well. So maybe, you know, spending a little bit of time looking at who are the Chinese actors in all of this artistic movement would be interesting. Uh, you know, the, the people who are building this, uh, new buildings, uh, they are certainly Chinese workers. Uh, what, is, uh, what are they doing? Are they being trained to, in Western uh, methods? You know, a lot of, of the things that are being built in the time that Anthony Clark mentioned, these are you know, local workers. What kind of technology is being used? I'm sure Professor Commons, you have done millions of uh, articles on this thing. So I, I'm, I'm just thinking uh, of, this interaction being in between. Uh. It's, it's striking when in one of the essays, Grisnicht acknowledges that the some of the Chinese are said to not like the Sino-Christian architecture and would prefer the Gothic. And he basically says, oh, well, don't listen to that. They're not being straight. They're simply trying to be polite to you as the Western missionary. And that's his way of basically discounting what seems to be critiques from the Chinese Christians themselves, um, where he writes it off as simple politeness on their part, not wanting to criticize uh, the Western architecture. But that's a pretty layered way of essentially writing their voices out. Yeah. In, in the book I'm finishing now on Shu Shan, I'm writing a chapter on how the missionary perceive the perception of the Chinese. Because often the Chinese, they have no voice. And certainly uh, the average Chinese, they, they have no voice. So I can trace them on photographies. So you see how they behave in a church or how they behave in a pilgrimage on a pilgrimage site. But often they are only known through the lens of what the missionaries is, are writing about them. Let yeah. me... Oh, sorry. Oh, Eugenie, yeah, the, other, the other thing that I wanted to add just very quickly is also the 1920s and 30s and 40s are the object of what we're talking about today. But I try to introduce what is happening in China today with architecture and show that, that Disney-esque kind of architecture. And Professor Clark also introduced how you know, the new buildings are reconstructing that sort of uh, Chinese Gothic architecture. So maybe we can know now what Chinese priests, uh, Chinese bishops, uh, the Chinese flocks think of this architecture. Is it reflected of what Chinese thought of that uh, back in the 20s to 40s? Maybe not, but I'm wondering if that can help us. This is an excellent question, but I would, I'm gonna insert first my own question and then a, another question here that's, that includes uh, Professor Steinhardt actually. First, I, I just want to say, if this could be a huge can of worms, but uh, Vincent Leb became a Chinese citizen in 1927. So let me just ask if he would be considered a Chinese voice, question mark. That's a complicated uh, question. Um, but then again, uh, here's another one. In the, in the Chinese novel, Dream of the Red Chamber, Hong Lo Meng, there's this huge theme between Zhen and Jia, false and, and real. Uh, Professor Menegong, you just mentioned, you, you have this great neologism, Disney-esque. Uh, and then Professor Steinhardt has written about Muslim architecture in China. And Professor Kumans discussed this French firm that was helping to build Furin Dasha, Furin University. So we have Dutch, French, Chinese, uh, all of these, this, this great mixture of voices and, and, um, and voices. The question here is, so at the end of Professor Kuman's talk, you showed some brackets. Quintessentially Chinese are, is bracketing. Everyone who thinks of Chinese architecture, I think they focus on bracketing. But here you had this example of a Chinese bracket that was fictional. It wasn't real. So sort of directing maybe toward all of us, maybe Professor Steinhardt a little bit, what makes, you know, thinking about visible and invisible, what makes uh, Chinese architecture 
or Sino-Christian, what, what is it? Is it fake, real, an admixture of both? Um, how do we think about style? How do we think about questions of authenticity? Well, I guess you're waiting for me to say something, so I, I shall start. Um, Islamic architecture also will come up on Wednesday because it's, it's an extremely important counterpart through which to look at Christian architecture. One of, the, one of the exciting ways to look at Chinese architecture, but also one of the most frustrating is to look outside to see what's most fundamental about China because that's what has to be present. And the bracket sets and the roofs are the two features that absolutely have to be present. One of the things that struck me about that second to last picture from Fu Ren University that uh, Professor Kuman showed from standing above was that I have an almost identical picture from a mosque. It's, I, I, I don't have it in for uh, Wednesday, but I, I could send it to you. And uh, the, so th that's part of it, that, that there's always something fundamental and therefore unique that many other civilizations don't have. Brackets set the roof, whether they're in reinforced concrete or brick or ceramic tile or whatever form they come in. The roof I would place as more important, and I think, I, I think I'm planning to say this on Wednesday also, because the roof projects above and in a low built environment that's, that's surrounded by walls, a person can see that roof no matter what is below the roof. And so in some of the buildings, I love the word chinoiserie for what uh, we've been talking about today. And I, I, I think it's appropriate. I think it's in some ways more appropriate than acculturation, but I've got my own words, which I will also give you on, <laughs> on which I'll also give you on Wednesday. But the, the roof to me is what's most fundamental and that's what's preserved. And I, I was expecting somebody today to talk about big roofs, but I, I will be mentioning them. And they're in very, very important, not just to um, missionary architects or Christian architects, but to everyone building in China in the first half or really the 1920s and the 1930s. Uh, I, and they are, that they are the one, the roof is the one immutable feature that a person can't escape from. And, and that's, that, I guess that's my, that's my answer to what you just asked me. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, that, that before I open it up again, that makes me think of the 1980s where there was a law passed in Beijing and other cities, I think, that if you build a skyscraper to make it Chinese, you have a Zhongguo uh, Maozi, you put a Chinese hat yeah, on Yeah, hat, Chinese hats, yeah. So you have these sloped roofs on the top, top of skyscrapers that, quote, made it Chinese. Any other questions or responses by anyone here um, that, we, that we, we still have a good amount of time? Professor Wiest seems to be there. Can you hear me now? Oh, yes. Yes. Yeah, yes. Oh, Glad to see you. Oh, it's nice to see you all. Yeah, really. Oh, uh, so many questions and comments came to my mind listening to you guys. Very, very nice presentations. Uh, just a little tip, tidbits. When um, Stephanie talked about the light and so on, by the way, I talk, I thought about the religion of the light, Jing Jiao, already, you know, trying really to, to enter as much as possible in the Chinese culture through their own text. And what did they use? Buddhism, because Buddhism just enter. So, so you see that, that mix of cultures that goes into becoming Chinese. So when, when we talk about Westerners trying to, to inculturate, acculturate and so on, uh, it's, it's a process that keeps on go, uh, going and fusing. Uh, this is one, so, you know, Buddhism was important. And so they, they build their own pagoda and so on. The same way, you know, Westerners came into China. When they came in the 19th century, there's a, there's a problem then with imperialism and trying to impose and so on. Uh, 
but this slowly fades away by the time you enter the 20th century and you have missionaries like Leb, Kota, and so on, that try to be as Chinese as possible and to look at China through Chinese eyes. And you will have to wait later on for real Chinese bishops, but some of them was going to train uh, the Western way to slowly put architecture in a more Chinese way. And you will end up with a building more or less Chinese like the Anguo Cathedral that doesn't exist um, anymore. That's a pity. But, but there's a slow process. And I think this process is still going on. Another point I would like to make is that we had to put architecture, Chinese architecture, within a larger context. And uh, Stephanie, you show some paintings. So the painters are uh, important. And the writers, the literature, is also part of that whole process of inculturations. And um, Menegan, thank you very much for mentioning the role and the importance of the Chinese themselves. Yi Lianzhi is very important. Ma Xiangpo is very important. Chen Yuandu is, are very important. And they are the one that are really the architects of that uh, transformations. And we need to know more about them. We need to study more about uh, these people. And hopefully the Chinese themselves will do this kind of uh, research and uh, study. Well, I'll stop here. I have so many, so many things to my mind that I just wanted to put a little input in the conversation here. Thank you all. Professor Weiss, thank you. And I, I also know that you have thought quite a bit about the, the Guangdong, the Guangzhou Cathedral under the Vision Etrangère de Paris. Yes. And, uh, yes. Could you say something about what your thoughts about that yeah, are? This is a very important po point. When, when, when the bishop arrived, that, that used to be uh, uh, the palace of the, of the governor general. And here he's planted his cross and say, my castillo is going to be there. You know, what is a better example of uh, French imperialism and so on? But then the Castle came up. It was designed by French architect. But here you see, if you still go there, some of the gargoyle are Chinese. Okay. And then so later on, you move to Favier, and Favier put a little more Chinese into it. And then we have to look at the reverse side. How uh, this, you know, uh, Chinese, you mentioned those Chinese little roof now on those buildings in, in, in Beijing. But that happened also in the West. Slowly, when they moved, they built the major seminary in Hong Kong. They also put a lot of Chinese reverse roof there on an architecture that's very Western. And then, you move to the US, you go to Marino, look at the Marino Seminary. It's a typical uh, monastery type of things, exactly like Kuman So, but with those beautiful curving Chinese roof. And that was for people in America. This is Chinese. This is Chinese. And now when we go to Beijing and so on and look at it, oh, we say, oh, we Western say, no, this is not Chinese. What, what are we doing here? Completely two different assessments of same buildings. Hello. Yes, no, we, we were captive, captive audience. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs>
So, so yes, thank you very much. Um, before I forget, so we have five more minutes. Before I forget, I just want to announce that Professor Menegon is speaking, I believe tomorrow, something like in Eastern time, 6 to 8 p.m. Can you, before I forget, can you tell us a little bit about your lecture tomorrow evening? We'll have a full day tomorrow. I'll say something about that, but. Yeah, just a second. So I can paste it if you're interested uh, in. So there is no, I, I mean, it will be unfortunately I, overlapping, I believe. It's uh, 6 to 8 p.m. Uh, uh, Central European time, which in here in the United States means uh, that it will be two, 12 to 2. So unfortunately, I had taken this uh, uh, thing a long time ago. So I will be able to be with you guys only for parts of, of uh, the day. And I am not poaching this, this conference. So you guys should stay here and enjoy the conference. Uh, um, but I'm giving the information if uh, someone else who will be not here might be interested. Sure, by all means. Thank you, thank you. There's one last question. We just have four minutes. Um, I'm gonna read it briefly and we may get to this tomorrow. It's by Laida Lin. Many thanks to the conference organizer and all the speakers. This morning, we've heard discussions on Constantini and Gresnik's practice in China from the perspectives of Catholic history and culturation strategy of architecture and theological ideology. But in adopting Chinese architectural tradition, there should have also been an aesthetic understanding of it that could justify architects' adaptive approach. We know Henry Murphy, he's a Protestant, was writing, summarizing five characteristics of Chinese architecture. Interestingly, Gresnik had three uh, that he adopted in his design. I have to go back up because more questions are coming in. Hold on. I got lost here. In his design, are there some writings by Costantini or Gresnik eulogizing Chinese architecture, or were there understandings of, of Chinese architecture, or, or where was their understanding of architecture from? That's right. So I think the essence of that, the kernel of that, we should, this is a good question. Where did Gresnik and Costantini get their understanding of Chinese architecture from? Excellent question. I'll open that up to anyone who would like to uh, confront that question. Well, I, I answer that question. The, I said that uh, Gresnicht had uh, 10 months to understand Chinese culture. <laughs> he arrived in, uh, in March 27, and uh, he started to design in early 28. So he had less than a year, and he stayed in Beijing. So he visited everything he could visit in Beijing. And uh, he read the few books that were existing at that time uh, available uh, on Chinese architecture. That's not a lot, but I presume he had the big album, you know, made by the Japanese uh, the, the, about the Forbidden City and this kind of, uh, of, of remarkable documents where you have a Western drawn details of Chinese architecture. Um, and he was certainly visiting these places with people who could tell them, but he wasn't speaking any Chinese words. So he had to have a translator or to have a Chinese who could explain him in one of the languages that he was speaking. But uh, I have no name. Once he said that he worked with a Chinese architect, but he never mentioned a name. So um, that's not clear. But on the other hand, to answer what another question that was raised before about this French company, uh, understand and make a big difference between Beijing that is close to Tianjin, where you have all possible engineers, the mm -hmm. best materials coming from the States, Japan, and Europe, engineers, technology, railway connections, bringing things easily. So, in Beijing, they could build a, build a modern Western building like the Furen Tashui in one year. It was possible. I just finished to write an article on a cathedral in Sanxi, built in 1940 41, the last built in China at the time of the missionaries. There is no rebar, there is no cement, 
that could not reach that point in 1940. So you have again to make that time and space patchwork of China where things are very different according to the place where you are. Building in Hong Kong, in Shanghai, in Beijing, in Tianjin, in Dongbei was completely different than building in deep China where the local missionary had ide vague ideas, had to work with the local craftsman and generated really uh, a crossbreeding that is completely different with all the things we have seen and spoken about today. And that is what is interesting in China. It's not A or B, it is as many possibilities as you have different works. That is why architecture history is not only talking about styles, it's looking at construction, at materials. You have to draw and measure yourself to understand how things are built and constructed. And it is from the language of the material that you could understand things that no text is talking about because these people, they build and they don't write. And that is the building archeology, span uh, so it's an other approach. And well, I tried in my speech to show different things and that architecture is not just styles and not just inventing new names of new styles that never existed as such, because every building can generate something different. Professor Kumans, thank you. For methodology, you understand? Really a question of methodology and the source, the main source is the building itself yes. when it's still existing. Yeah. Thank you, thank you. Well, for in my part of the planet, it is lunch. In uh, <laughs> Professor Kumans, in other parts of the planet, it is uh, late. I think in Europe, maybe you haven't had dinner yet. It's not even not 11. Nine. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, uh, let me just very briefly uh, note that I, I also I wonder to answer that question or to think about that question. What would what would Grezhnik and um, uh, and uh, Costantini thought about Chinese architecture had they had Professor Steinhardt's books to have read uh, at that time? But tomorrow we will begin uh, again at 8 a.m. my time with uh, Dr. David Wong's talk, and the respondent will be Dr. Daryl Ireland from Boston University. Then Dr. Joseph Ho will speak. And then Dr. Amy O'Keefe will provide the response. Then Dr. Reverend Dr. Robert Carboneau will be speaking, uh, responded by Dr. Christy Chow. And we'll end that. And then finally on Wednesday, we will have the keynote by Professor Steinhardt, where certainly she will say more about roofs. But again, I just wanna say how absolutely joyful it was for me to be connected with everyone and how much I've learned uh, from the respondents, the speakers, and from the questions. Uh, thank you so much, everyone, and I look forward to seeing you all again tomorrow uh, at our various times throughout the planet. Thank you, everyone.